we left off, we, last week we began talking about translations, because remember we're starting modern day and working our confidence backwards in order to know whether or not we can trust the scriptures. So we're starting with, can I trust my modern translation? And then we're gonna back up, can I trust the transmission process as it was carried out over a couple thousand years? And then can I trust that I've got the right number of books in the Bible? And then we're looking at, can I trust that the people that wrote these things down were trying to trick people? And then can I trust, were they really saying people that wrote down the right things that weren't just hallucinating the things that they wrote down? So we're starting here in our modern day, but we're going to keep working our way backwards. Because if we can trust all five of those things, we can have historical confidence. Remember, we'll never have mathematical certainty. But we can have historical confidence. And we live our lives based on historical confidence. I mean, I live, even though I didn't see it and I can't prove it, believing that the US Constitution was signed by the original you know, signers, that that actually took place. Well, can I mathematically prove that? No, but can I have historical certainty? Yes, so that's what we're going for with the scriptures. Uh, the chart that's up there, that was up there, there we go, that chart, uh, reminds us that we have translations on a big spectrum, and I know you can't read that, but this has helped me, helped me keep my place, that on one side you have translations that go very word for word, New American Standard, English Standard, King James Version. If they've got one word, they're gonna translate it word for word. On the other side, New Living Translation, New International Version, do more of a thought for thought. They take the thought, of what the original author wrote and try to say, how would we express that thought today? So what I wanna do with us to kind of see what that looks like in reality, rather than me hand picking a, a particular verse and, and showing it to you, I wanna show you on any random verse in the gospels, what that might look like. So, um, Somebody that I did. Give me a number from one to four, Shirley. One to, one to four, and you say five. All right, let's try this again. Three. All right, she picked three. All right. Let me. All right, uh, I've got the number three. Uh, Katie, give me a number between one and 24. 12. All right, and let's see here. I need a number between Bela, one and 59, 58, troublemaker. Okay, so we have Luke chapter 12, verse 58. So if I gave you a Bible, don't use yours. Use the Bible that I gave you. Everybody else, if you have a Bible with you, join me in a randomly chosen verse in Luke chapter 12. Verse 58. Well, it's a good long one, so we'll make sure that we get some variants. Good job, Bela. I take back my troublemaker. I was really afraid we were going to get the Jesus wept, and this was not going to work at all. So this, this it gives me a whole lot of confidence here. All right. So Luke chapter 12, verse 58. Uh, I gave someone, uh, I don't even remember all the translations, a uh, Christian Standard Bible, a CSB. Who did I give it? Will you read that verse to me and, and loud so we can all hear? All right. We got that one. I gave someone a new international version, an NIV, I believe. I thought I did. I, maybe I didn't grab that. Did I not give anyone? What's that? It is Luke chapter 12, verse 58. All right. Who else did I give a Bible? Let's do it this way. I gave you one. Would you? What does it say on the front of yours? Oh, you got the Geneva Bible. All right. So this could be fun. Go for it.
All right. Did you guys hear a difference between those two translations? Even if you couldn't quote it back, did you notice a difference? They, the Geneva Bible, by the way, came out in 1599. So it's older than the King James. So thank you. I'm glad I gave that to you. I appreciate it. All right. Who else did I give a Bible to? I gave you one. The next translation. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. Sounds close, but a little bit different even from that. Very different from this one. That was the net translation. It's actually a translation that has lots of notes that you can go online to see tons of different notes. She, she probably skipped over a whole bunch of numbers that were written over words that she read. By us. All right, well, I gave you one, and you got the, I can see the new revised standard version. All right, all right, wait. All right, so notice some of that was do this or, some of it is do this less, do this or he will. You, you see, we're getting our, tra our, our transition from one half to the other very differently. Did I give anybody else a Bible here tonight? All right, I'll, I'll read for you the English Standard Version. If I can find my, there we go. As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. What's that verse say? Or what? All right. His sounded very different from everybody else, didn't it? With the thou's and the thine's and the all. Oh, What's that? Hit the goest. Yes, that's a fun word there. Is it goest? Did it say the same thing as all the others? All right. Pretty much the meaning of it. While there there are going to be nuances. All right. Like some of them, you might you get more of a negative feel to that second part. One is do this. That this not happen. Yeah. Some of them read more, do this so that it might not happen. And some of them, if you do this, or this is going to happen. It, there's a different feel to the second half there. But all of them are giving the same direction. Man, it's, don't do the people's court thing. You know, you don't take matters in your own hands. You take them to court. No, I said, take it into your own hand before you get to the judge. Don't leave it up for someone else to make the decision for you. Take care of it. Now, that was a randomly selected passage that we got to and yet every translation that we looked at tonight was slightly different in which words it used to translate now when you've got that many translations and because of what we just did would it be fair to say that because there's so many translations we don't know what the original said All right. One thing that we have to always keep in our minds is every one of these translations we just read from didn't draw from another translation. It drew from the original Greek. All right. Because Luke is written in Greek. So they, they all drew from the same exact source. In the fact that they're different doesn't give us less confidence. It actually can help us to have more confidence. Because if I'm trying to understand what the original said, but I don't speak the original, rather than reading one, I can read 12. And over the course of 12, I get a better sense of what the original was saying because they're all circling around that main point. So the fact that we have multiple translations doesn't lower our confidence in knowing what the original said. It raises our confidence. I see that here. Go. Okay. 
we don't, we're, that's going to be part of when we get into transmission here in just a little bit. We don't have any originals. All right. So we're going to have to deal with where are the copies kept in museums, hats on, you know, most of them are, you know, under glass because they're fragile and air can, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, but as for the originals, we have exactly none copies. And so that's why we have to deal with the transmission part next. How do I know that what we have is what the authors really wrote in the first place? That's going to be, we're, we're coming to that. We're going to spend a whole big time on that. All right. Other questions where we're at? Yes, Luke. Oh. Um, Awesome. Uh, with most and every one that was read tonight, now I'm not saying every translation does that. Every major translation does that. And at the beginning of your Bible, there's a section that you guys skip. All right. So look at the, of your own Bible, or if you want to look at one that I gave you, that's fine too. Before Genesis 1 1, my guess is there are some pages there after the table of contents, or they're nearby the table of contents. There might be a page that has like, okay, here's the illustrations, here's the, but there might be a page that says introduction or forward or something along that. Preface, there you go. If you read that section in your Bible, it will tell you the philosophy used in translation. Some of them will tell you which uh, copies of the Greek New Testament that they, they based their findings on. Most of your major translations give you that information on those pages you have ignored since you held your Bible. There's actually a reason they're there, and it's to answer Luke's question right there. How do they come about doing this? Uh, and so it will not only tell you which text they use, but why they their overall philosophy in translating. Good. Other questions? And if it's not there, you can usually find it online. They'll put it there. Okay, so what that's doing is this. When, uh, is that a new King James? Oh, the ESV, okay. So what they did, when they when a translation says it echoes another one, what it means is this. All right, I've trained, I've done my work of translation here. I haven't, I understand what it means. I know that people's ear is used to hearing this word for this verse. So rather than me arbitrarily picking another word, I'm going to use, because it's an accurate word, the word they're used to that they memorized it when they were a child. So they're not afraid of saying some of the choices in translation that we use, we did so because people are so used to it in the King James Version. And that's why we chose those words. That's what that means. Yep. Good. I like these questions. Well, Luke, you got another one. Yes. Um. Uh, the net is one that the Geneva one, that's about the closest one to not being influenced. That's probably, if anything, going to be a little more. Wow, that's well, no, Geneva's going to be reformed. So that's going to be Protestant also. Um, the net might be on that line because they tried to just go different. They really didn't try to follow a tradition. They just wanted to give a word and then say, here's how you might. Be able to use that, look it up online, and give you a whole bunch of stuff on it. Um, one that we didn't use, and I'm going to get to here in just a second, is one that will fit that, and I'll introduce that in just a second. One that's not based on a Protestant translation philosophy. Right. So what that means, and that's, you know, gets down into your philosophy of translations. Uh, the American Standard Version, not the New American Standard, the American Standard is what the Catholics use. American Standard 
version is the translation Catholics use. You'll find the Apocrypha in it. Uh, and so the way they handle some of the grammar uh, that can be read one of two ways will lean more towards a Catholic understanding versus taking that grammar to read in a more Protestant way that the ones that we typically find in our churches will use, okay? And so that is one thing, and we'll get into that a little bit with transmission. How do we know which one is right? How do we really handle those grammar things? That's why that first page is there to let you know this is what we assumed going into it. Yep, sure. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, I, I recommend if you're going to be a serious student, you need lots of different translations from all across the spectrum. Um, and that's how we have to do. Now, uh, I don't know if you put it up there. Go ahead. Uh, there's only a very small percentage of words or phrases that scholars disagree on the proper translation of how should we translate this verse. All right. This is when the grammar is confusing. Let me give you an example of what that would be like in English, all right? Imagine you had to translate this sentence into a foreign language. One morning, I shot a man in my pajamas. All right. All right, so, but do you, you understand what I'm saying? How the grammar, if I'm reading this and trying to translate it, and the other language can't just do it word for word, but it has to specify who was wearing the pajamas based on my bias going into it is going to affect how I translate it. Is that sentence saying one morning I was in my pajamas and shot a man? Or is it one morning I shot a man because he was wearing my pajamas? It's, it's one sentence, but the grammar's not clear. And so that's why sometimes the scholars disagree on what is the proper translation of that sentence. What is, let me just say this, what is Paul trying to say? <laughs> okay, now, with that being said, you got to recognize that there are no major doctrines of Christianity that rely upon any of those questionable grammatical structure translations. None. So we can have confidence there. Uh, also, good translations often acknowledge alternate translations or uncertainty. The ESV does a great job. You should recognize this over if you've had it for years. There are times there's a little bit of number next to a word or a phrase, and you take it down to the bottom, and it says, or, and then gives you another sentence in italics, saying it could have been translated this way. So rather than just saying we have perfect certainty, don't even pay no attention to the elephant behind the curtain, it's saying, look, it could have read, you could take it this way. And then what well, I really love, there's one in Isaiah where it just says, the meaning of this is uncertain. Yeah, this was our best shot, but reality is we have no idea how to translate it. That's why some translations, you actually find the word marshmallow. See if you can find another one. Uh, all right, some other, I was like, I should get you. No, you don't know. see if you can find marshmallow in the Bible. All right, now, here's one of the benefits of having a lot of different translations. It helps you spot a bad translation, all right? So for that, and if I gave you a foreign bio, I won't make you read it out loud, but I, I need you to look it up and see if, if you're close. Everybody go to John 1.1. Whatever Bible you want to look at, go to John 1 1. And yes, I know many of you can quote it, but I don't want you to quote it. I want you to read it. All right. And when you get there, if you are comfortable reading it out loud, fire away. Let me hear a few different translations of John 1 1. Emory, go. Okay, somebody else, a different translation, go. 
All right, awesome. Somebody else with a different one. Go. Awesome. That sounds remarkably so. Can somebody else go? Anybody else? Same exact thing as that. Is that is it pretty close? Oh wow, okay, awesome. Right, so the only difference is they use the word that in the Geneva translation. So but minuscule all right. Let me let me read my translation. In the beginning was the word. Let's see. I see I did it. I I, I quoted rather than reading. In the beginning the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. Whoa, what's the problem here? What you got you like threw a fit when somebody else read their translation? What is what's that? Not close. Jehovah Witness Bible. All right. The Jehovah Witness came out with their own translation called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Their scholars, and this is going to Luke's point, if you have all of them from the same traditions, you might allow a bias to creep in that none of the others will correct. Now, you guys recognized immediately that while almost word for word perfect with yours, I had one letter difference. Oh, the letter A. Now I have more than one dot. Okay, but do you see how reading that in a bunch of different translations helps you to immediately identify there's something drastically different with this one? Are you starting to see that having multiple translations is not a bad thing, it's a good thing? There are benefits to having these multiple translations. And by the way, I keep this on what I call my danger shelf. Uh, I have some books that I keep in my office that are bad, bad books. This book stays on that one because there are many more errors than that one letter in this translation that's done by Jehovah Witness scholars to carry out Jehovah Witness theology. Okay, so again, not all translations are good. So using the test of time and the scholarship that you know is very important when looking when looking at translation. So um, having many translations, this next slide here, helps us in our different uses of the scripture. It helps us with devotion work, with preaching, with study, with schol scholarly work, every different translation has a place in that spectrum. If I'm reading for pure devotion, I can tell you, I have I've moved a little bit away from the ESV for the devotional work to the CSV, which, which I, I gave Ryan to read. It's the new translation that's come out of uh, Southern Baptist life. Southern Baptist worked on it. And it used to be the Holman Christian Standard, which I hated. Uh, and almost everybody universally hated uh, that translation. So they went back, they listened to everybody of what parts were grading them the wrong way. And they went not quite back to square one, but did a lot of work going back. And they came out with a very readable and understandable Bible. But it's more thought for thought. And it reads smoothly and it's great for devotions. But I'm not ready to do my scholarly work, my preaching out of it, because that ESV does a lot of word for word. And the way that I go verse by verse, it really helps to see some of those things. Uh, and, and so there's different places for those words. So in short, remember translations come from the original language. And I'm just talking about the good ones here, okay? Two, they serve different audiences. Some of them are serving the sixth graders. Some of them are serving the college scholarly work. They have different people they're serving. They serve different purposes, devotional work, scholarly research. And they keep one another in check as all of you guys groaned when you heard one little word that was different. All of you went, whoa, wait a minute. And that's, you can do that with any verse in the Bible. If, 
if you're reading and you read it from five or six different translations, if one of them is off in left field, you can start to ask yourself, why is that one so drastically different? And you can, you can research it. Why did they say this when none of the other translations have anything close to that? Does that make sense? All right, so there are benefits in that. All right, so that's going to bring us to the end of translation. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. People, one, of, one of the major ones, like, it wasn't a very readable Bible. And they were kind of arbitrary in when they would go word for word and when they would go thought for thought without really letting the reader know when they were doing which. So that was a problem. But the biggest one is most of our Bibles have the word Lord in all capital letters when it's the divine name, capital L, capital O, capital R, D. You know in your head that means it's the name of God. The Holy Christian Standard Bible decided they were going to put the word Yahweh every time. And a lot of people were not comfortable if the Jews wanted to revere the name so much that they wouldn't even pronounce it. Why would I want to be pronouncing it just when I'm reading through and, you know, now I'm forcing other people to do it if I want them to read scriptures. And a lot of people had major objections to that. So when it was being printed in the quarterlies, people who've had, you know, our senior citizens that have been in class and church forever and told they're not supposed to say that word. And now you're giving me curriculum that's forcing me to read that word. A lot of people had a major objection to that. So that's one of the things, but they really fixed the readability, and it's a lot more consistent now. It's staying thought for thought rather than trying. Let's do word for word here, but then thought for thought here. Yep. Pretty much right in the middle. Pretty much right. Because it did it sometimes, it's not others. Yep. Yep. You're off the hook this week, so we didn't get anywhere close to you. Okay. I asked her if I could embarrass her son this week, and she said, yeah, but we're not going to get to it because I'm almost out of time. All right. I'm trying to think, do I just stop here or do I do the introduction to transmission? I'll stop here. That'll be, that'll be better for that. So next week, we're going to pick up with transmission. All right. So be thinking about what kind of objections do you have you heard? What kind of objections might you have? And how can we have confidence that the text hasn't changed over the last 2,000 years? So how can I have the confidence that what I have is really what Paul wrote, right? That it hasn't been changed by, you know, scribes who just said, I don't like this word. I'm going to think about those things. We'll discuss those starting next week. Let's close in prayer, and then I will let you guys go. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, and I praise you that as we hold these Bibles in our hands, that we can have confidence, Lord, that what we're reading are accurate representations of what the Greek actually says. Father, what we're reading in the Old Testament, also true for what the Hebrew or Aramaic says. And so, Father, we pray that as we continue to increase our certainty, and that the Bibles that we hold are the Bibles you meant us to have, May our faith increase, and when others bring up these childish arguments against the words that we're holding, that we might be ready to contend for the faith that was passed forth to all, for all of us. So help us to be confident, and may our faith grow to your glory. For I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.